So um, I'm here to talk about conformal inference and how to do that in tiny models. Conformal inference, you put those two words together, and if you would ask me maybe like a year ago what they mean, as a statistician should be like, I don't know. So you know, um, it's kind of like a, an oddly named technique. So in hindsight, maybe a better title for this uh, presentation was how you can make prediction intervals uh, for any type of model without making very much uh, statistical assumptions about your data or your model. Uh, just to remind you, uh, if you want to put in some questions, here's the link for it. And also, um, in this wee tiny little font down here, you can see the, uh, the link to the slides if you want them. All right, so maybe I should start first by saying, well, what's a prediction interval if you've never heard of that? And so a prediction interval, it's like a confidence interval, but it's an interval on a, a separate type of, of object. Um, if you had like a 95% prediction interval, that means that you have a bounds where 95% of the time, a new observation that you would acquire later will fall into that interval. So whereas confidence intervals are on the, like the mean prediction, this is about new observations. And the little um, diagram here shows you both confidence interval, which is kind of very narrow for this data set, um, and a wider prediction interval. And you can see there's a couple of data points on the bottom and a few on the top that don't fall in. So that's like a, I think that's a 95% interval right there. Um, people use these uh, when they can get them, which is not that often for models. Um, it gives you a sense of like uncertainty about your prediction usually. So, um, so it gives you a sense of like, you know, how much should I um, like, uh, not trust the prediction, but you know, you can like sort of calibrate your expectations as to how good the, the prediction is. All right, so let's start with just some data, right? So this is just like, you know, just like a histogram on its side. Uh, it's 500 data points. Uh, it's centered around zero, you know, maybe like plus or minus like, I don't know, 0.15. And so, you know, you spend some time collecting this data and then you get the 501st data point and let's say it falls down here. And it's like, well, you know, it's not outside the range per se, but is that like a new data point from the same distribution or is something like change, like the model drift question and things like that? Um, and so what we can do is if we were like from a statistical standpoint, if we want to make some sort of judgment about whether this new data point is from our original distribution, one thing we could do is use like good old fashioned quantiles. So if you wanted to do like, a, let's say you wanted a 9% interval, what you could do is get like the uh, 0.05 quantile on the lower end and the 95% quantile. And if you had, um, if you were to make like a completely distribution free probabilistic statement, about that, you could say that you know 90% of the time when I get data from this distribution, they're gonna fall in between that interval. And so like this is where the conformal part comes in. So you would say that that new data point, if it fell within that interval, it conforms to sort of this original reference distribution here. So if you were to take this data set, compute those particular intervals, so there's a lower 5% and this is like the 95% interval um, quantile, and you would think that any new data point that falls in here uh, would be consistent with the original data. And you can see, of course, there's false positives, 5% of the time here and 5% of the time up here. And this particular data point, you would not really consider to be consistent with the original data. So why am I telling you this? Like suppose instead of me just saying we have some data, let's say they were out of sample residuals. So let's say you fit some sort of regression model, you had an extra data set, you know, just laying around like we do all the time. And um, you took that, that model and you predicted on this different data set, you can compute those residuals. And so that gives you a sense of, for the data that was um, collected, especially in, in what we would call this the calibration data set, you could say like, on average, you know, this is what I expect the, the, the noise around my predicted values to be based on these residuals. So if this is a training set, um, and this is a, just a nonlinear function I fit to it, um, you know, we build the model on this data set, we take that same model fit, to the calibration data set, these 500 I just showed you and calculate the residuals. And that generates this histogram that I, I just showed you. And then what we can do is we can take this into you know, the zero centered histogram and basically center it around the uh, predicted values of our model. So this is like a test set. So we get new data points. We, you know, the same model fit here. Oh, and by the way, it's com I swear to God, it's completely accidental that these colors match the ones of our t-shirts. I didn't realize until like an hour ago, I was like, oof. Um, it's not like me. Um, so anyway, so these are like the, it's a consistently, um, consistent with band around the uh, predicted values in here, and I guess we're calling that purple. And you can see some of the data points don't fall inside the band, and some, and, but mostly they do. And this is basically something akin to a, a prediction of, well, it's just going about it in a, a completely different way. 
Most prediction intervals are what we call parametric. We have to make some sort of statistical or probabilistic assumption about your data and the model and things like that. Um, so what we tend to think of when we do these conformal intervals is that they have, if, if it were like a typical um, prediction interval you get from just straight up linear regression, we'd say that you know, a particular data point has a coverage of let's say 95%. But in this case, what we would say is on average across all the samples that we use, the coverage for that interval is 95%. So it's really the, the additional bit here is average. Um, usually, for most uh, conformal methods at least. So if you're a statistician or, some, or something like that and you're interested in the methodology, um, there's been quite a lot written about this, especially lately. It's been kind of exploding uh, both in, in terms of papers and in terms of visibility. Um, it has a very strong frequentist um, um, theme to it, if, if you know what that means. We're making, we're basically using uh, quantiles and empirical distributions. And it's sort of, when you read about this, it, it really sort of kind of ties in in an indirect way to what we would call non-parametric inference. So anyway, so that's all well and good. Um, so what's good about it? Well, they, they make very, these intervals require very, very minimal assumptions about your data. Exchangeable data means that if I just reorder the data, you know, I can get the same results. Right? And, and that's not true for time series, but it, it's generally true for a lot of other situations. And of course, time series are important, so there are specialized conformal methods that are related to time series. Um, Matt Dancho's model time package has those in them, so you can get those if, if that's your thing. Um, it can work with any type of regression or classification model. So, but so far in the probably package, I've only implemented it for regression. So we're working on that. And it's relatively fast. There's a couple of different methods I'll show you. Um, the ones I'll show you are all you know, relatively fast to both train the, the conformal interval um, method and to, to make new predictions. There's one called full conformal, which is the one that honestly kind of makes the most sense to me how this thing works, but it's abominably slow. So we have that in tiny models, but like, you probably don't want to do that. Anyway, the cons is because it doesn't really make any, you know, it's making minimal assumptions. And as you'll see in a little bit, um, they don't necessarily extrapolate well. So if you're making a prediction on a new sample and it falls well outside of your training or calibration set, the coverage of that, or even the interval itself, may not be very good. Um, and so you know, that's a little bit different than what we would see in things like linear regression. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, what, so if, if that's a problem, if you're not sure, you might be saying to yourself, well, how am I going to know if I'm really extrapolating if I have a bunch of predictors? Um, we do have something called the applicable package. Uh, it was generated by one of our um, interns, Marley, a couple of years ago. And what that does is it's used to quantify how much I'm extrapolating from my training set. So you can use applicable to, to have a score that gives you a sense of like, or how far out am I? Or am I sort of like in the middle of my training set? Um, and they're probably not great for small sample sizes, for some like definition of small. Um, you can get probably intervals, but you know, it's hard to say what their coverage would be. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show you some code. So I'm gonna have a training set that is 1,000 data points, a test set that's 500, and a calibration set, which is where we compute those um, residuals of about the same size of 500. So you can load the tiny models package down here, and we're gonna, we're gonna be looking at um, some results if you use cross-validation, like v cross-validation. So I generated a cross-validation object here using tiny models. Uh, the model I'm gonna use, which doesn't ordinarily generate um, prediction intervals, is called a support vector machine, and here's some code to uh, specify the model, and then line seven here is we just fit that support vector machine model. And we can use that to generate the curve on that, or the, the curve on that data point or data set that I showed you. All right, so there's three different conformal methods I'll go through really quickly. The first one's called split conformal inference, and you've already seen it. So it's basically you take a model, you fit it to your training set, you predict your, your calibration set, compute the residuals, and go on your merry way. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, in tiny models, you load that uh, with a probably package. The functions we're gonna show start with int conformal. So in the, the last bit here is the method. So what you do is you give it your fit in your calibration set. It basically predicts the calibration set, gets residuals. And then when you wanna actually get the prediction, uh, predictive intervals on new samples, you give it, let's say the test set, and here you specify whatever confidence level you want. And then you can see you get new uh, columns here, pred lower and pred upper. What does that look like for the data set that we um, just used? is this, uh, again, purple line is our, uh, in this case, a board vector machine model. 
uh, prediction, and then here's our um, prediction intervals. You see some of them down here aren't really overlapping and, and so on. So, you know, as you might imagine, this is pretty fast, pretty simple. Um, again, the downside to, one of the downsides to it is the interval widths are always the same. So whether you, the, the variability in your, in your outcome data is really small or really large at different points, it's always going to be the same width. Um, you know, the downside also to this is you have to have an extra set of data laying around that you can use to estimate that distribution. Um, we don't always have that, so one thing you can do is you can use cross-validation. Um, every time you do cross-validation, you have some data you're predicting, uh, and those data points were not used by the corresponding model that generated the... Uh, um, the data you use for prediction is not the same data you use to fit the model inside of cross-validation. So if you do tenfold cross-validation, you have ten sets of sort of held-out residuals. And it turns out um, there's some math behind this that says, yeah, you can, with some slight alterations, you can do something very simple to um, split conformal inference. Um, the theory has only really been done for, for v-fold cross-validation. Um, so you can use other resampling methods and tiny models to do this, but you sort of get a warning to saying, like, you're at your own risk. Um, I have a link at, near the end of um, a GitHub repo where I've done a ton of simulations, and I did try bootstrapping with this, and it seemed to work pretty well. So no guarantees, but it doesn't seem like a horrible idea to try other resampling methods. So how that works is a little bit different than what you would normally do with resampling. Um, in your control object, you have to save the out-of-sample predictions. That's not very exotic. But the other thing you do is, if you're doing tenfold cross-validation, you need to save the ten fitted models that you generated uh, during cross-validation. So the easiest way to do that is there's an argument called extract and just give it the identity function, which just returns itself. Then you use the fit resamples function like you normally would. And then the inconformal CV uh, function just processes all that data, and this is the same thing as it was last time to generate the intervals. And so again, on that same data set, it, in this particular case, it's not always like this, these intervals are very, very close to the, the split intervals. That's not always the case, but, um, but it's what happened here. Um, also, one, one little note about this I found with very small sample sizes, um, when conformal, CV plus conformal methods center their interval, they center it on the average prediction of the 10 cross-validated models, not the actual model that you fit on the training set. So if you have a very small sample size, those two things might be different and your intervals might be kind of shifted in some places. Um, I, might, I might try to fix that if you can fix it, but um, it's just like a little note. And then the third and final method, uh, which is uh, very different than the others, is called conformalized quantile regression. So quantile regression is a, is a pretty well-known in statistics technique where, you know, when you fit a linear regression and you get a prediction, that's the mean of the outcome distribution. And in a, in a uh, quantile regression, like a quantile linear regression, what you can do is you can actually make predictions on whatever quantile you want. So if you want to do something around the center of the distribution, you would use a uh, um, a quantile regression with a 50% quantile, you know, 0.5 quantile to get the median prediction. But, you know, it's really, if we set it to be like, let's say the 0.05 or the 0.95 uh, quantile, that's really what we're trying to do basically in conformal inference, is we're trying to estimate the boundaries of, of what our predictive distribution is. And so it, it's really more direct approach to solving this. Um, this, this, this is the same data set I showed like in that uh, second slide where I had linear regression, and you can see maybe it might be hard to see, but you can see these are not equally spaced. So the upside to conformal inference uh, using quantile regression is that you might, or you very well can get um, uh, intervals that are not equally spaced like the other two methods. Now, linear, linear methods here may be not the best of ideas. Um, so what we do is what something other people do in the literature is we use a, a tree-based ensemble, um, specifically quantile random forests. And then um, that can give us a uh, prediction interval. And here's the same data set. You can see, for lack of a better term, I'd call this like a chunky sort of line. Um, but it will vary um, across the range if the variance changes across the range. The other thing to note here is um, you can see when the data stops, this is true of all tree-based methods, not just random forest, that it just sort of goes off in inf to infinity with like the same lines. And this is uh, especially bad if you start extrapolating. So you can imagine if I fit a linear regression to this or something for this particular data set, like this cloud of points, you can imagine that line just keep increasing. But the uh, conformalized uh, quantum uh, intervals will just keep going off in one direction. So you could extrapolate and uh, get very, um, you can get intervals that are so poor that they don't even contain the predicted value. So just with this particular method, especially have to be uh, very sure you're not extrapolating. 
All right, the code's a little bit different for this one. You need to give it your model fit, and you need to give it both the uh, training set and the calibration set. Um, so it, it works best with a split sample. And, you, and also, since you're estimating the quantiles, you have to get the confidence level up front. So instead of setting it in the, the predict method, you have to do it here. And then we use the quant, uh, uh, it's QRF function so for quantile regression forests. Um, so you have to tell it how many, you know, anything you want to pass to that argument or that function, you can do it here. So I'm gonna bump up the number of trees to 2,000. And then to get the actual intervals, you just, it's, it's a little bit more simple, simplistic. And what's that look like for our data set again? Um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, this seems like you might be like, wow, that, I don't know, that's kind of scary. Um, but it, it, performance of this is actually pretty good, despite it, the lack of smoothness of these intervals. Um, so when you do simulations and things like this, the, the idea that you're getting like step functions across a range is not that big of a deal, performance-wise. Speaking of performance, um, you know, we have to make sure it works. So this is a little bit different than your average machine learning method because we're saying if you get intervals from this function, we think they'll have 90, let's say 90% coverage. And so um, with this GitHub uh, repo here, I did like a bunch of simulations to make sure these things actually work the way they're supposed to work. Now for the data sets I showed you like this one, um, the coverages were very close to 90%. So for the original split, uh, conformal plot, it was you know just about, CB plus was 80%, and then we're very close to 90% for those individual data sets. And, and I have like a, a readme at, the, at that repo. Um, generally speaking, I, you know, I tried it with like trees and linear regression and neural networks and things like that. The, the sample size matters a lot, so your coverage may not be spectacular um, if you have a very small sample size, but I was, I was pretty happy with the, the average coverage of those methods. So they seem to be working and doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, so what's next? Uh, as I mentioned, we've already implemented uh, regression models, so probably sometime in the new year I'll start looking at doing the same thing for classification models. In classification in this particular um, domain, they, they typically are focusing on situations where we have like a lot of classes. So let's say you're doing like some, some sort of image classification and there's like 30 things you might classify an image as. What they focus on with conformal inference is saying, like clustering them and saying like, well, you know, what is it like dog and not, dog or hot dog, that whole thing. You know, if you have a prediction and you have two class probabilities that are pretty close, one thing conformal inference does for you is to so, tell you whether they're like sort of equivocal probabilities or not. And again, it's a fastly growing field. So if there's a new method, methodology that pops up, we will definitely take a look at it. Um, thanks to Tiny Models and Tiny Burst Groups for listening to me prattle about this and uh, test my, uh, my presentation. And, and Joe Rickard did a lot of uh, reading and, and help uh, with me on this to, uh, to get a sense of how these things actually work. Um, speaking of which, if you want to learn more, there's an article on tinymodels.org. Um, the two references I would really suggest the most here is uh, Christopher Molinar um, made this book. Uh, it says conformal inference with Python, but this is probably the best reference if you want to get like a like a layman sense of like how these things are working. So it's an excellent book, you can get it off uh, Amazon. If you're more of the statistical kind of person, uh, Ryan Timshirani has a really nice set of notes on the, the various methods and how they work. And then this awesome conformal prediction repo in GitHub has like any reference that comes up ever. Um, they'll pretty much list it in probably this talk or whatever there. So um, yeah, anyway, that's it, thanks. Thank you. We have a few questions coming in. Do these prediction intervals break down in the presence of heteroscedasticity? Heteroscedasticity. Uh, close. I, know, I can't spell it. <laughs> I won't even try. Um, yeah, the first two, well, they don't break down. They just, on average, they're right. So if you go to the, um, do I have Wi-Fi? If you go to the article on tinymodels.org, um, you know, we did a little simulation um, where we took something that had uh, different variants as you go. And so if you do like the split intervals, you know, they're, they're bad here, they're bad here, they overdo it here, so on average they're fine, right? So in other words, they don't, they don't, it's like you can't compute them, but they're just not especially great. And just in case you were wondering, you would probably use the conformal inference there and they sort of align pretty well. So you can see the, con the, the quantile method here is very tight in that area and, and widens out where it's supposed to. So that's what I would suggest if you think that's the case. Uh, yeah. Can these be used for anomaly detection in deployed models and then drive some sort of emergency action to avoid anomalous predictions? Yeah, that's a 
That's a good question. So um, I've seen people on social media say that. Uh, I don't know that I would buy into it so much. If you were using this, you could look at the width of the interval to get a sense of, of how it's going um, within, within the mainstream of your training data. So as long as you stay within your training data, um, you're fine. And actually, um, it wouldn't be very good at all for anomaly detection for something that's an aberration because it's extrapolation because look what happens as you go a little bit further. Right? It's like, boop, these goes off into infinity, and actually my fitted curve goes out here. So you know, this is the one you would probably use if you want to judge the uncertainty by the confidence interval width, because the other two methods have a, a fixed width. Um, and it only would really detect anomalies that are sort of where your data already live. So that's my answer to that question. We'll do one more. Um, when evaluating performance of prediction intervals, for example, coverage, is that something you picture living in probably, or some kind of uh, new package like Yardstick? Oh, well, like the evaluation of whether these things work or not? No, I'll just stuff that in a GitHub repo, because it's like a million files of simulations and things like that. But if, if the question is like, if you're gonna develop methods for uh, interval estimates like, like this, um, yeah, probably is the best place for them. Um, we've added a bunch of, Edgar actually, um, did a lot of work and added a bunch of calibration tools for, um, for models, we put this in probably. Probably, you know, it, it tends to focus on things you would do after the model, and that seems like um, the kind of thing that would fit there. So yeah, I'd, I'd most likely put them there. 